El Brales from New York City. Let's see. Where I'm not banned from corporate websites. <laughs> Around the end of 2024. Okay, so the options are not so great for <laughs> for uh, December. Around the end. That includes 2025, probably, right? Around the end. So there's close to one, two, and three. We're doing three phase threes. It's a lot of phase threes. Um. So 1.7 points.
And that's on ham D17. Hmm. You know what I want to look at is what does ham D17 look like for some other drugs? I guess they expanded the ham D. Was it 11 before? I don't really remember actually. Did Musk really say that? Juicy J. I'm just looking like the old Hamilton depression scale. MicroStrategy, best company. So you see, what MicroStrategy does is they take CASP and capital, they convert it into a different form of capital. And they do that for you. Servo med? I don't know that one. Okay, so this is um, Prozac after you have a heart attack. Interesting.
this is just some Balta. I don't know if I'm going to miss cassava, but... Item one of the ham D. Improvement in ham D was ten points versus seven point eight in placebo. So I guess like just getting two points isn't very good. Is that the theory here? I wonder what kind of power they have. That's true, Marshall, that's true. There'll be more shorts, don't worry. Do not worry. We will get more. Why did I become Russian? I don't know. Why would Lily run this study? I guess 2004 makes more sense. Darn it, where are the, all the... I think Chegg is a little less exciting as it's gone up a lot, so keep that in mind. Oh, I guess I could use um, the wonderful website called SciHub. Nice, 140. Himmy Hendrix, you're him. You did that. Congrats. Big boss moves. Cardi B. Okay. This is very useful. Very, very, very useful. There's a table. MD total. Ah, very interesting. And this is a week, what? Week eight. And this is Symbalta versus Axel.
so yeah I mean this isn't that bad because if these drugs gave you three points I guess if the Navicap rank gives you one 1.7 points what what good is it is the question but can you give it as an adjunct that like boosts your anti-depression scale a little bit but I'm not sure who would who would want that prescribed I guess Trying to get my head around, like, is this clinically useful to have a drug like this? And then we have the, um, this data from the Lily drug. And it seems like kind of similar to the Navicaprant. So let's see, this is Atacaprant. a table or something in here somewhere. I think there is one. Here it is. Okay. So this is at week six. So they're basically going to replicate the Atacaprant study 2.1 on, is this HamD17? Oh, this is Madgers. 2.1 on Madgers may not be 2.1. They got 3.1, but these are different scales. And then there's Samidorphin, which is another one to keep in mind. And I want to note the standard error of 1.05. Here's Madgers. Minus 9. Minus 12.1. 14.1 and minus 13.8. So on Madgers, you got five points. So three points for Atacaparant makes you wonder why would I use this drug? If it's a safe adjunct, you know, no big deal, I guess. But let's look at Samidorphin too. Oh, yeah, and let's look at the uh, standard errors here. Um, they're lower, a lot lower. Generally around 0.5. So is it surprising that you got 1.7 on HamD17, about half the effect size of a normal antidepressant? I don't know, this is a, sort of a tricky one, obviously. I'm not sure, Wald, Wald Maestro Bros. Uh, you sold out of the money calls, and now they're deep in the money. So, the stock went up. You can keep selling calls, I guess. I mean, if you have more calls than you have common, you will eventually be short the stock if you sold more calls. So if you have the same amount, you've basically sold the stock, if that makes sense. I don't know if that makes sense or not. You, you know, asking ChatGPT is not such a bad idea either in this case. But if you had 50 calls and 5,000 shares, you're hedged. You sold 50 calls against 5,000 common. 
you were hedged. No, stuff like cassava happens all the time in biotech. Bebo, it's hard to say. Sometimes you don't, you shouldn't necessarily always just be taking profits left and right. Hmm. Sometimes you want to let your winners keep going. Okay, now I want to look at Sammy Dorfin. GHRS. Nope. What is that? What is the name of this drug again? Sammy Dorfan. Just buprenorphine. A thousand dollars? I'd guess I'd guess I'd buy some books. I'd buy some books on whatever it is I was trying to learn, like computer science maybe. Roche have a great acquisition track record. I'm not sure. They're okay, I guess. Their intermune deal wasn't that great. EMA take 30 days to review what? <laughs> uh, filing for acceptance? I'm not sure. Yeah, Martin, we're going to do AI in Godel. I can only do one thing at once, otherwise I would look at every stock in the world for you guys. The girlfriend wanted to short cassava, but she did not. Next time. Okay, so here is forward four and forward five. And they are combined. What the? So this is placebo. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, this makes sense. Similar result. I get one or two points. They didn't bother to get approval, but they got rejected, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, I don't want wifey to take big risks, you know what I mean? Okay, here's the table we want to see. P values are all fail here. Set sale to fail. So it's just not that great of a result. 
I guess one of the problems was the power. Like, they didn't... Yeah, I mean, why is this not just alchemies all over again? Right? That's probably the best way to look at it. This is just alchemies all over again. It was a great pick at um, at twenty bucks. Let's see the Jan puts. <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. Well, that's a uh, that's interesting. So if it happens before December, December 20th, you, you get lucky. But it's $2.34 a share in cash. So let's see here. The 10 puts would be worth 766, and they're trading for 410 to 450. <laughs> so let's say 430. So you would make uh 78% if the chart if the stock trades to cash which it may or may not okay let's try the seven and a half this would be worth 516 and they're trading at 265 okay that's a bit of a better trade there and then the fives conceptually at least would be worth 266 and they're trading at a dollar 30 again kind of in line with what you you would expect all the way up and down so let's see the 15s conceptually would be worth 13, 12 13 bucks so at $8 you would only make 60% return so are the December's not going to work? They said near the end of 2024. Let's go back to our calendar from Cassava. <laughs> so let's see. Saturday, Sunday. So Monday, 21st, 22nd, 23rd. Tuesday is the 24th. Do we have Tuesday off on the market? There's no weeklies here, right? So Wednesday is Christmas. Thursday is the 26th. Friday is the 27th. 28th, 29th, and 30th is Monday. I don't remember if the market's closed on New Year's Eve. I don't think so. I think it's open. So... There are six trading days after the 20th. And 16 trading days before the 20th. What do you guys think? Is there a chance? Oh, I should look at Clinuvel. I haven't looked at Clinuvel in years. I tried to take over Clinuvel, as you guys may know. I mean, okay, so let's say there's a 20% chance it comes out. Okay, let's try to do it that way. There's a 20% chance. What would those prices look like? So the 
10 puts are, I don't know, $1.60. So with the implied probability, oh, okay. It's, they're sort of implying a 40% chance that they make it. As opposed to assuming the January is implying a 100% chance. So is there a 40% chance that they make it? Is there an arbitrage here? If you knew the date, you could arbitrage it quite well. Hmm. Did they do a conference call? This isn't FDA related T sizzle. This is company related. I don't think the stock is going to drop that far, though, because they might meet the primary endpoint, but it's just not that clinically significant, and the stock could get cut in half, and they're sort of dealing with the Alchemy's situation all over again. I think maybe just short the stock. It could double, which I don't want. <laughs> mm, maybe you sell the calls. Maybe that's a strat. And that way you kind of neutralize yourself. So let's say the 20, the 20 calls. Nobody wants to buy them is the problem. <laughs> it almost feels like they're a decent hedge. What are the 10 calls are like nothing. It's like maybe it's just a long vol. We're also waiting for data on Humicite, which is an interesting situation. Control Z is the undo shortcut, Willie. Well, yeah, I'm curious what Numora said if they did a conference call. I don't think they do. Oh my God, everyone uses the NASDAQ thing. I need a new IP address. Yeah, exactly, Zach. Feels like Numora. I don't know. It's hard to say. I'd be surprised if Numora hosted a conference call for earnings. Let's see. Oh no, they do. Huh.
speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to Helen Rubenstein, Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Good morning, and thank you for joining Numora Therapeutics' third quarter 2024 financial results conference call. Before we begin, I encourage everyone to go to the Investors and Media section of our website at numoratx.com, where you can find the press release related to today's call. With me today are President and Chief Executive Officer Henry Gosebrook and Chief Financial Officer Josh Pinto. Head of Research and Development Rob Lenz will join us for the Q&A portion of the call. I'd like to point out that we will be making forward-looking statements which are based on our current expectations and beliefs. These statements are subject to certain risks and uncertainties, and our actual results may differ materially. Please review the risk factors discussed in today's press release and in our SEC filings for additional details. With that, I'll now turn the call over to Henry. Thanks, Alan. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our first ever quarterly conference call. Brain diseases collectively represent one of the greatest medical challenges of our generation, affecting upwards of 1.5 billion people globally. They are the leading cause of disability with a significant impact on quality of life, not only for patients, but for their caregivers, families, and society at large. We all know somebody affected by brain disease, and at Nomura, our goal is to bring the next generation of medicine forward to alleviate the substantial unmet need. To achieve that goal, we have developed a robust portfolio of seven clinical and preclinical programs, all targeting novel mechanisms of action in their respective indications. Importantly, we believe that each of our programs has the potential to reshape the treatment of its target indication, making a significant difference for the patients and families we aim to serve. I'll start with our lead program, Novacoprint, which we are investigating for the treatment of major depressive disorder or MDD and other neuropsychiatric conditions. MDD is a leading cause of disability worldwide, affecting more than 280 million people. Yet, it has been more than 30 years since a drug with a novel mechanism of action has been approved to treat it. People living with MDD often experience inadequate treatment responses and or significant tolerability challenges, leading them to discontinue standard of care treatment. In fact, up to 85% of patients either don't receive pharmacological treatment or don't achieve remission with first-line therapy. And approximately 70% of people with MDD experience anhedonia or the lack of ability to experience pleasure from daily activities, which is not adequately treated by existing agents. We believe Navacoprand has the potential to reshape the treatment of MDD. Navacoprand is a highly selective, novel, once-daily kappa opioid receptor antagonist that we are developing as a potential monotherapy treatment. The kappa opioid receptor antagonist approach has been clinically validated in three independent studies. In our phase two MDD study, Nevacoprand demonstrated efficacy in treating depressive symptoms, including anhedonia, in patients with moderate to severe depression, as well as a favorable safety and tolerability profile with no weight gain, sexual dysfunction, or other adverse events commonly associated with standard of care. It is designed to be easy to use as an oral, once daily, 80 milligram dose without titration. Nevacoprand has the potential to make a significant difference in the treatment of MDD and beyond if our development efforts are successful. The COSTAL program includes three replicate phase three randomized placebo-controlled double-blind studies, COSTAL-1, COSTAL-2, and COSTAL-3, designed to evaluate the efficacy and safety of nevacoprid monotherapy in adult patients with moderate to severe MDD. We're also advancing an open-label extension study, COSTAL-LT, designed to evaluate the long-term safety of nevacoprid. To support the coastal studies, we are deploying a state-of-the-art approach designed to strengthen probability of success that includes significant enhancements to both study design and operational execution relative to phase two, which are detailed in our corporate deck. We know that both study design and execution are crucial for successful MDD studies, and we are laser focused on the coastal program. 
We look forward to top line data readout from Coastal 1 around the end of this year and to data from Coastal 2 and Coastal 3 in the first half of next year. We are also exploring the potential of Novacoprin as a treatment for bipolar disorder and are pleased to be advancing a phase 2 signal seeking study. This study is designed to inform further development of Novacoprin in bipolar oh, 2 market's depression, closed. potentially including development in broader bipolar disorder populations. Workday reported. It is power to show an effect size, albeit not power to show statistical significance. We look forward to sharing results from this study in the second half of 2025. Beyond the microprint, we are currently evaluating NMRA 511, our vasopressin 1A receptor antagonist, in a phase 1B signal seeking study in people with Alzheimer's disease agitation. Bunch of software. We look forward to reporting data from that study in the second half. 2025. Additionally, we are continuing to pro progress our M4 franchise with an IND for a second M4 positive allosteric modulator or PAM expected in the first half of 2025. We believe that with our franchise of several M4 PAMs in development, we are well positioned to become a leader in muscarinics, an important new class of medicine. Finally, we are advancing a deep pipeline of additional novel clinical and preclinical opportunities addressing such conditions as Alzheimer's agitation, schizophrenia, Parkinson's, and ALS. With these programs, I believe we are well on our way to achieve our mission of redefining the development of novel medicine for brain diseases. With that overview, I'll turn the call over to Josh to review our financials. Josh? Thanks, Henry, and good morning, everyone. Our financial results for the third quarter of 2024 are detailed in the press release that we issued this morning, which I encourage you to read. I'll take a moment to provide some context and highlight a few key points. As we advance our industry-leading CMS pipeline, we are focused on disciplined capital allocation that we believe will enable us to leverage our strong balance sheet to realize multiple catalysts across our program. Total operating expenses for the third quarter were 76.6 million, compared to 56.9 million for the same period in 2023. The increase was driven primarily by activities related to the phase three program for Novacoprant, ongoing studies across the rest of our portfolio, and investments to support the growth of our business. We ended the third quarter with 341.3 million in cash, cash equivalents, and marketable securities, which we expect to support operations into mid-2026. We believe this runway places us in a very strong financial position to execute on our goals. In fact, over the next 18 months, we have five clinical catalysts on the horizon, including three phase three readouts for Novacoprant in MDD, data for Novacoprant in bipolar depression, and data with NMRA 511 in Alzheimer's disease agitation. Additionally, our preclinical portfolio comprises programs targeting novel mechanisms of action that are supported by promising early evidence. I believe that this represents an industry-leading neuroscience pipeline and sets us up well to achieve long-term growth. With that, I'll now hand the call over to Helen to manage Q&A with the operator. Helen? Thanks, Josh. Before I turn it over to the operator, I'll ask that you limit yourself to one question. If you have an additional question, please feel free to return to the queue. Now I'll turn it over to the operator to handle Q&A. Operator? Thank you. As a reminder, to ask a question, please press star 11 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. To withdraw your question, please press star 11 again. One moment for questions. Our first question comes from Paul Matisse with Spiegel. You may proceed. Hi there, this is Julian on for Paul. Thanks so much for taking our question this morning. Um, we're just wondering, is, is there a final sample size that you guys have for Coastal One that you'd be able to share? Uh, and we're curious if there's any upside to original powering assumptions there. Thank you. Hi, this is Rob. Uh, I can take that question. So we, uh, we have three uh, replicate phase three studies ongoing, all of which were powered uh, or are powered at approximately 90%. Uh, 
they are targeting uh, approximately 332 uh, patients in each. Um, uh, when we did design the coastal studies, we actually did build in the ability to increase the enrollment by up to 25% in a seamless way, meaning without requiring us to conduct the protocol amendment. So, uh, you know, look forward to sharing the details on the enrolled population, including the final sample size uh, at the top line results. Thank you. Our next question comes from Brian Abrahams with RBC Capital Markets. You may proceed. Uh, hey, good morning. Uh, <laughs> thanks for taking my question and congrats on all the progress. Um, recent studies have shown that um, placebo rates can sometimes be uh, pretty tough to keep down in, um, in neuropsych studies. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your confidence in the conduct of the coastal studies uh, and maybe some of the QC measures that you're em employing, how, how you believe they're, they're working um, in, in terms of how you're balancing patients uh, across the sites and uh, diverting towards the most um, uh, reliable validated uh, centers. Thanks. Hi, this is Rob again. I can, I can take that question. So we've implemented a number of measures in, in the coastal program at a program level as well as at a study level to really focus on increasing the overall probability of success. So at the program level, I mentioned, we're conducting three trials with the expectation that we would need two of those uh, to be positive. And then at the study level, there's a number of uh, things that we implemented from both a design perspective as well as an execution uh, and oversight perspective that we think increases that overall probability of success. I'll just mention a few. So from a design perspective, uh, we did uh, move from the Handy 17 to the Modris as the primary outcome oh. measure. This is really driven by the, the fact that the Modris better captures the clinical concepts of anhedonia, which is something that we should benefit with with Novacoprin in our phase two study. So we feel that the, the Modris better captures the, the holistic benefit that we would expect to see uh, than the, the Handy 17 does. Uh, we did uh, implement equal allocation in phase three between those patients coming into active and those uh, going to placebo. Uh, we know historically that reduces expectation bias, which in turn reduces placebo rates in trials. And then on the execution side, we really implemented uh, what we feel is sort of state of the art. Uh, I'll mention just a few. Uh, one is we're utilizing central raters for the administration of our primary outcome measure to help ensure that patients coming into the trial have the uh, appropriate degree of uh, depressive symptoms as assessed by the Madras. Uh, we are also uh, having every patient uh, conduct video apps to confirm compliance with study drug administration and drive compliance in, in the study. And then in terms specifically of placebo, you know, we, we spent a fair amount of time training the sites, but also implementing a placebo script. And this is something that the sites administer to the patients on each administration of the Madras. And, and the literature, again, supports that that's a, a technique that can, uh, can help mitigate uh, placebo responses. So, you know, in aggregate, you know, we really feel uh, we've been laser focused on doing those things to increase the, uh, the overall probability of success of the, of the program in each study. Thanks so much. Thank you. Our next question is from Yatin Sineo with Guggenheim. You may proceed. Good morning. Um, this is Iris on for Yatin. Congratulations on your first question. Oh, look at call. BTC. Um, so we previously guided for discontinuation rates lower than phase two. Now that we're getting close to the readout, is it fair to assume discontinuation rates in the five to 10% range? Thank you. Yeah, this is Rob. Um, uh, I won't comment specifically on, on the details of the discontinuation rate. I'll say that we overall were encouraged by the discontinuation rates that we're seeing in the study and look forward to sharing the details on the baseline characteristics uh, when, when we show the top line results. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Miles Minter with William Blair. You may proceed. Uh, hey, thanks for taking the question. Um, we've been receiving some inbounds just on the, the pretty benign safety profile here for Nevacopran and whether that's inherent to the drug itself or 
whether that might be a sign of maybe patients being underexposed for a CNS drug. I think for, specifically for this mechanism, you know, people are pointing to the lack of itch seen at the 80 mg dose, um, you know, somnolence levels that, that might be lower than we expect for a CNS drug. So can you kind of just level set for us, like, where the dose selection for the 80 mg came from, how you're ensuring correct exposures in your ongoing coastal program, and I guess, um, you know, are you achieving that target receptor occupancy at, at Kappa? Thanks very much. Hi, this is Rob. Yeah, I can take that. So, uh, so overall, we've been quite uh, encouraged by the safety profile, and that's based on the totality of data um, from both the phase one and the phase two studies to date. Uh, I think importantly, uh, we haven't seen um, uh, some of the troublesome uh, side effects that are seen with existing therapies like um, weight gain or sexual dysfunction. Uh, in terms of specifically around our confidence in the, in the dose selection, that's really predicated on a couple observations. One is we conducted a human pet receptor occupancy study, uh, the intent to, to assess which doses and exposures are, are resulting in uh, significant receptor occupancy through the entire dosing period. And what we found is that the 80 milligram dose achieves uh, exposures in the brain uh, that resulted in approximately 90% receptor occupancy throughout the dose. and how that might influence your own um, M4 program. Thank you. Yeah, I can, uh, this is Rob, I can start with the first question. So I, I'd say we look forward to sharing the details of, uh, of, of the design characteristics when we have the top one results. I'll just reiterate that this is a, 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 it's a not a typical way uh, to, to implement uh, increases in sample size from an ongoing study without having to conduct a formal um, uh, protocol amendment, and this was, uh, you know, part of the design that was submitted up through through the FDA. 
Um, in terms of the M4 program, uh, you know, Sir Policy did not comment on, on other companies' data. Uh, what I will say is we do remain confident in our M4 um, franchise. Uh, so by way of reminder, uh, uh, we do have multiple programs, uh, each which has unique uh, chemistry and unique attributes in pharmacology. Um, just by way of, of, of recall, these programs uh, were licensed from Vanderbilt, uh, uh, and that's uh, a group there uh, that has you know, tremendous expertise in medicinal chemistry and really uh, industry or, or sort of academic leading uh, experience in the muscarinic space. So, you know, we're very much looking forward to uh, bringing our next M4 PAM uh, to the clinic in the first half of uh, next year. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next question comes from Charlie Yang with Bank of America. You may proceed. Hi, uh, thanks for taking my questions. Uh, can you just confirm, you know, whether the, the last patient kind of was enrolled for the cost of one, and if so, kind of when what was it? Uh, when was it enrolled? Thank you. Hi, this is Rob again. I can I can address that. So we, we won't comment specifically on, on details of, of enrollment. I will just reiterate uh, our confidence in, uh, in uh, delivering the top line results around the end of the year and the things that we put in place uh, and the resources to help ensure that that happens. And we can share, you know, we'll look forward to sharing those, those details uh, as we uh, share the top line results. Thank you. Our next question comes from Miles Minter with William Blair. You may proceed. Hey, thanks for taking the follow up. Um, just on the IP with Vanderbilt and your uh, Muscarinic franchise, do you have any IP around M4 agonists or other cholinergic drugs that are maybe you know, changed in selectivity for M1, M4. Uh, it just sounds like you've got to focus on the PAMs, which is understandable, but wondering whether you have flexibility to pivot outside of that selectivity. Thanks. This is Josh here. So, Miles, in terms of the franchise that we've been able to pull together with our partners at Vanderbilt, you know, it has been focused on M4 PAMs up to this point. Um, you know, we believe that that, you know, pharmacology has potential and, you know, we feel as Rob has mentioned, very good, you know, about moving our programs into the clinic in the first half of next year. Um, and so, you know, I'm not going to be able to comment any further just around the specific IP with the franchise that we have, but, um, you know, feel good about, you know, what we've been built and put together with Vanderbilt. Cool. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. That will conclude the Q&A portion of today's call. With that, I'll turn it back to Mr. Gosebrook for closing remarks. Thanks, Josh, and thanks again to everyone for uh, joining us this morning. Uh, as you've heard, it's an exciting time to be at Nomura, and as we move forward, our goal remains steadfast, to redefine neuroscience drug development by bringing forward the next generation of novel therapies that offer improved treatment outcomes in quality of life for people suffering from brain diseases. We're looking forward to the first of our three phase three data readouts for nevacoprend around the end of this year with two more phase three studies reading out in the first half of next year. As discussed beyond nevacoprend, we are also advancing a deep pipeline of additional novel clinical and preclinical opportunities to address such, such conditions as Alzheimer's agitation, schizophrenia, Parkinson's and ALS creating a catalyst-rich upcoming year for Nomura. And to take this opportunity to thank our talented and dedicated Nomura team, all of the progress we've made today is the culmination of their hard work and their commitment to the patients we serve. Thanks again, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. This concludes the conference. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. I don't know. Don't know.